Batman's life is in a major period of change. What will this mean for Gotham City and his allies? Well, let's hop into the pages of Batman issue number 86 and find out together, shall we? Alrighty then, so as this brand new story from James Tyne in the fourth opens up, we are treated to Batman's internal monologue. It seems that when he wasn't out chasing down muggers or punching super criminals, Batman would often doodle on napkins or whatever he could find, buildings that didn't quite exist. Basically, he was subconsciously dreaming about a Gotham that could be a Gotham City that could be safe and work without the existence of Batman. Alfred, of course, nurtured these ideas of building in young Bruce, and now that Alfred is no longer longer with Batman, he's been thinking about these plans to rebuild Gotham City even more now. You know, I gotta say, I like the idea of the Dark Knight having architectural aspirations when he wasn't out crime fighting. We so rarely ever get to see what kind of hobbies or interests Bruce has when he's not wearing a cape. Now, while all of this is going on, a clandestine meeting of some of the most famous and deadly assassins in the DC pantheon is going down in Gotham. You got such heavy hitters as Mistress of Poison Cheshire, as well well as Green Arrow foe Merlin, who has thankfully dropped the dumb Malcolm part of his name. Why, you've even got some new blood like Gunsmith, who is exactly who you think he would be, and Mr. Teeth, he's creepy. They've all been brought together by Deathstroke for a very secretive job, but we don't exactly know what that is yet. What we do know is that tonight is a very special night for Wayne Industries and their renewal effort. A big gala ball is being held for the rich and powerful of the city, and Selena Kyle is on hand to entertain and schmooze. This is kind of interesting. Again, Tynan makes it very clear that Batman and Catwoman are still very much an item, but they don't exactly go into greater detail about the official relationship between Bruce and Selina. If nothing else, Bruce clearly trusts her enough to be in a room full of a bunch of vapid rich people with a bunch of easily snatched wallets and jewels, and I mean, if that's not love, what is? Now, Batman is already aware of the super assassin threat. He intercepted some messages on the dark web, and he's got Lucius Fox working on a brand new vehicle for him. Oh sure, Batman has had lots of vehicles in his life, boats, planes, helicopters, you name it, but this new invention called the Nighthopper can climb up walls and even fly. Basically, Batman spent a bunch of money and built his own frickin' Transformer. In fact, it would seem in taking down Deathstroke and the other assassins, Batman showcases that he's put way more emphasis on his gadget armory than ever before, working smarter, not harder, as the saying says. My personal favorite are little shadow projectors that makes each individual villain think that Batman was chasing after them specifically when in fact the true Batman stayed behind to have a fight with Deathstroke. Slade is cheeky as ever rubbing salt in old wounds saying that he had heard through the grapevine that Bane had totally beaten Batman, that he had gone crazy, that he's weaker and softer than ever before. In his arrogance, too, Deathstroke even manages to let it slip that this whole assassin meeting was actually one giant smokescreen and that the real target was actually the Gala Ball. Luckily, Batman has Catwoman with her boots on the ground ready to deal with the threat, which in this case turns out to be a weaselly little man covered in sickening boils. The man speaks in a voice that is not his own, but it's made very clear that Bruce, in trying to revitalize the city, rebuild it, make a new Gotham, essentially, has made him some new enemies. An enemy with some very deep pockets if they were able to buy the best of the best in a hired killers. Even though Deathstroke is defeated, it's made very clear that this threat has only just begun. If nothing else, though, Batman's new flying machine ends up working without a hitch, and as the comic winds down, Bruce's thoughts once again turn to Alfred and that he wishes he could have been here to see this. And so that was Batman issue number 86, everybody, and James Tynan's run is off to a lovely start. It's completely new reader friendly, which is always nice to see. And if you did happen to be a fan of Tom King's run, don't worry, I'm sure there's something you'll find to enjoy here, as Tynan doesn't really throw away anything King did in his run. Bruce and Selina are still together, and it looks like we're going to explore their relationship more. Alfred is still dead, and Bruce coming to terms with what that means for him definitely seems to be coloring what he's doing here in this book. In fact, in a very sad but very poignant moment, Bruce accidentally calls Lucius Alfred. This book also ties together some nice continuity, too. We discover that Harvey 
Bullock is acting as police commissioner right now because, well, Gordon got all infected by the Batman who laughs over in that series. Overall, I thought this was a pretty good start to a brand new series. Tynan as a writer has put in a lot of time and a lot of work on other books, and I'm glad to see he finally gets to write the AAA Batman book here. I would give this an 8. Hey there, everyone. Kate Joel again, and I just want to thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. It means a lot to me. And hey, if you enjoyed the book I covered in this issue and want some comics of your own, might I recommend Book Depository? It's my number one place for shopping for comic book trades. You get a great price, and if you use my link down in the description, you'll actually be helping me out at the same time. You get something, I get something, everybody wins, right? So until next time, everyone, I've been Joel, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.